Welcome to this uh, CNCF webinar where I'll be talking about uh, policy-based access control uh, using Open Policy Agent, which is a CNCF graduated project. But first, who am I? I'm Anders and I work as a developer advocate at Styra. Styra is the inventors of Open Policy Agent or the Open Policy Agent project and uh, one of the main contributors. I have a long background in software development and primarily in identity systems. For, I worked with OPA for about two years now. And when I don't, I'm mainly interested in cooking, food, and football. And uh, I'm on Twitter, I'm on GitHub, and if you want to connect, feel free to do so. So policy is code and OPA. What's, what's the challenge we're trying to tackle? What's, what, what is the problem we're trying to solve here? Uh, I think one common theme here is pretty much to manage policy in increasingly distributed, complex, and heterogeneous systems. So we have all these application stacks, programming languages, frameworks. We have deployment platforms like Kubernetes. Uh, we have the underlying cloud and infrastructure. And we have data in all, in all its forms. And all these systems, they, they can tend to deal with policy in their own way, using their own uh, domain-specific languages, their own way of logging, and so on. So what we're really trying to do here is to unify policy enforcement and the way we deal, like manage policy, distribute policy, and uh, log policy decisions across this whole stack. And that's really what OPA is about. There are there are many other systems to you know, work with policy. If you check, if you zoom into one of these, uh, one one of one of these icons or one of these systems, you'll probably find ways of, of working with policy for just that system. But OPA is trying to to tackle the problem at large. So what is OPA then? It's an open source general purpose policy engine. And general purpose, it kind of has to be in order to, to fulfill this kind of promise of, of uh, unifying policy management or unifying policy enforcement across this diverse set of technologies and products. U OPA offers a unified tool set and a framework for working with policy across this whole stack. OPA decouples policy from application logic, meaning that you can uh, extract policies from, from your regular business logic or application logic, sort of like you'd extract uh, so, uh, some of the data management to a database, you'd extract policy to OPA. So that's kind of what we mean when we talk about decoupling. OPA is a decision engine, so it, it returns uh, decisions. It doesn't really enforce them itself. That's still up to your application, what, what uh, it's meant to do with that response. So if OPA says, no, this should not be uh, allowed or this should be denied, it's still up to your application to, to actually do something about it. Maybe send back a 403 or whatever is appropriate uh, in that context. Policies, they're written in a declarative language called Rego, which we will uh, look into uh, closer uh, a little later today. Since uh, we are talking about a general purpose policy engine, we're seeing use cases here ranging from uh, anything from Kubernetes admission control, microservice authorization, infrastructure policies, data source filtering of attributes, uh, or CICD, like build and deployment pipelines. So there's policies all across the stack. Uh, and OPA is really, uh, OPA really uh, fulfills this promise of, of unifying policy enforcement across the stack. So OPA is a, a vibrant open source community. I think these numbers might even be a little dated by now because uh, last I checked, we had over 5,000 uh, GitHub stars. Uh, 
and even 4,000 Slack users. It doesn't really matter. It's a big and vibrant community. And, and not only do we have the Open Policy Agent project uh, like proper, but also there are many interesting uh, projects uh, beneath that were included in, in, in the whole big OPA project, such as conf test for testing like config, doing config validation and having policies on, on uh, configuration files. There is gatekeeper, OPA gatekeeper for doing uh, admission control. And there is uh, plugins for uh, editors such as VS Code and IntelliJ. Of course, OPA is not just a, it's not just a hobbyist open source project, but it's also been used by, by some of the largest companies in the world. And if that's not enough to convince you, maybe this quote will. The Open Policy Agent project is super dope. I finally have a framework that helps me translate written security policies into executable code for every layer of the stack. So that kind of summarizes what OPA is about and also why it's so useful. So OPA then, how does it work? How can, how can OPA service requests for all these diverse uh, services and all these diverse uh, technologies? And uh, the answer behind that is the policy decision model. The way it works is that any service, and this is normally an application, uh, or it could be an Envoy proxy, or it could be the Kubernetes API server, or it could be a Kafka. And again, so this is, this is where the general purpose uh, model comes in. Any service, anything that can service requests, uh, reaches out. When, it's, when it receives a request, it reaches out to OPA, and it asks for a decision. Uh, and most normally, it's, it will also provide some data as part of that request. And that data is just JSON. So it says something, I, I have this information here. I have maybe the name of the user and some roles. And here's the endpoints that this user is trying to access. Should this uh, uh, request be allowed or not? And OPA will make a decision based on the policy which we have uh, provided OPA from before. And based on that policy, OPA will make a decision. And that decision is also just JSON. Uh, so, so that kind of that is the secret sauce be, behind how can how can OPA work with all these technologies? Because any product or project or service uh, capable of of sending HTTP requests and parsing and crafting JSON can, uh, can, uh, can be integrated with OPA. So as for deployment, OPA itself, it's a tiny little uh, self-contained binary. So it's a single file. You just, uh, you just run it and, it and it has all everything you need included. And ideally, you deploy OPA as close to your service as possible. Uh, this would normally mean that you run it on, on the same host as your application, so on the same machine. Uh, or maybe if you're, in, if you're in the Kubernetes world, you'd run OPA as a sidecar, which essentially means the same thing. You're, you're, you'll run OPA in the same, uh, on the same machine as your uh, main application. So when you query OPA, it's it's always on localhost, and the benefit of, of of doing it this way rather than having like a big giant central OPA somewhere, is of course that the distance between your app and OPA is going to be as short as possible to keep the latency down. The way OPA or your application communicate with OPA is then through the REST API, again following this policy decision model. But but if you have uh, applications written in Go, you can actually use OPA as a library as well. There's also uh, integrations for o Envoy Istio, and you can also compile policies to WebAssembly. So there's there's really a wide array 
of of deployment option as well. But the the one you'll see mostly uh, deployed is is the the REST API. So policy offering then, how does that work? And how, how, do, we, how do we provide policies to open? Uh, the way Rego works is it's really a high level policy language uh, and a declarative one at that. And what, is, what does that mean? It's essentially like SQL where you, rather than saying exactly how you want something done, you, you say what you want done. And then it's up to the policy engine to figure out the best way to, to go about that. A policy is pretty much any number of rules. So that, this maps pretty much to what a policy is also in, in, in real life. And a rule is, a, a rule commonly returns something. And uh, that could be any, any value which is valid JSON. So it could be a Boolean, like true or false, whether are you allowed or not, true or false. Uh, but it could also be more, more complex objects like strings or lists and objects. Pretty common pattern you'll see in policies is of course that you return maybe a reason why somebody is uh, denied. I think there's almost 150 built-in functions today. And uh, uh, Rego is not like a general purpose programming language. So these built-in functions, they kind of tend to focus on things that are useful in, in the context of, of policy offering. So you'll see things like validating certificates, uh, checking uh, or verifying JSON web tokens, date and time functions, IP address ranges, things like that and and things around identity and permissions that's really what we're working with here uh, for testing we opa ships with a testing framework so you can actually test your policies in isolation it's a very well documented project and uh, so the i think one of the better documented projects uh, i've i've had a benefit of working with. And there's also the uh, the Rego playground, which we'll uh, look into in a few minutes, where you can actually try policy offering without even downloading OPA. So policies, they're, they're only half of the story, uh, because normally a policy can't do much without some knowledge about the world around it. So if we, if we for example, say that any user to access this endpoint, the user needs to be an admin. Then we also, in order to make a policy decision, we need to know the roles of the user. And that's what we call policy data. And that data can be provided to OPA uh, either as part of the input, uh, like as part of the query. When we ask OPA, we can say, I have a user here uh, and this user has these roles or is uh, she or he allowed to uh, uh, to access or to retrieve this data but we can also uh, push data into opa beforehand so we, the data is already available when we when we query opa for decisions or we can use the bundle api to pull data from a remote endpoint and finally, there's also a, an HTTP send function, which is really just an HTTP client, which we can use from inside our policies to, to fetch data at policy evaluation time. Okay, so at this stage, I'm actually gonna show how simple policy offering uh, might work. And of course, I'm gonna use now the Rego Playground and uh, I, encourage anyone watching to to do the same just see what it see what it uh, how it works and how we can work with policies so what we have here to our right that is the input data which the in this case we're going to simulate uh, a rest api or or an api or a microservice something servicing 
uh, regular HTTP requests. So we have a path. The user is trying to access a path. In this case, it's the user's path. And we can see that the, the, the request method here is a GET request. And we also have some basic user uh, information. In this case, only the, the name of the user. So our, our policy then is going to, is going to have to decide whether this should be allowed or not. And yeah, a get requests on the user's endpoint, that seems, that seems pretty fair. Like anyone can probably read all the users, uh, given that, that it's not like any private information or so. So, so it seems fair that we have a policy that, that would allow this. So again, a policy is just a series of rules. So the first thing we're going to want to add here is a rule. In this rule, in this case, I'm going to name this rule allow. And again, uh, OPA doesn't really care about your names. So allow has no special meaning for OPA. It has a special meaning for us uh, as people, but to OPA, it's just the name of the rule. And the anatomy of the rule is kind of like this. So you have, an, you have a name of the rule and you have a body. And if all the conditions uh, inside of the rule are true, so we do something like this. One is equal to one, and we evaluate this. We're going to see that, yes, uh, the, the, the allow rule is now true. And if we do something like this, we're going to see, no, it's no longer true. It's no, no longer nothing. So by default, uh, if a rule does not evaluate, it's just undefined. So if we want to change that, we could do something like this. We could say by that by default, allow should be equal to false. And now if we query, we'll see that this kind of fallback condition is triggered and, and we'll always get a response. So if we change back here, we're going to see that it's true. And remember, I said that all conditions inside here need to be true. So if we do uh, something like this, we're back to false because this is obviously not true uh so the way you can think of of this is pretty much like if you're if you come from another programming language you could you, sh you would probably write it uh, like this and then you'd add after each line you'd add an add condition so if if one line evaluates, it will hop on to the next line, evaluate that. And once, uh, once it doesn't, the, the condition is, or the rule is just going to be undefined. Unless of course, as we did here, uh, we declared a default value for a rule. Oh, okay. So this is just like silly constants in use here. So let's make something useful. If we say, uh, if the path and we're going to use the global input here, which is, of course, the values we see here to our right. So with the input path is equal to users. Yeah, then then this should be this, this should be uh, true, right? Because the input path is equal to user. So we're going to say that if that happens, uh, yeah, the, we should allow that. But of course, in this case, the input method could be delete or put or something trying to modify this users. And we don't want that. We don't want to allow that. So we're also going to say that if the input method is equal to get. And uh, one thing we might want to change here is how, how this kind of, there's uh, using a string like this. We can't really know is, is the application always going to provide us with uh, like a, uh, a leading slash like this or a trailing slash or so. So uh, what we could do here is we could use Opus built-ins, the built-in functions. Again, there's uh, 150 built-in functions. So what we could do here is we could say uh, at the path, if we try and uh, maybe trim these these uh, we're going to say, and we're going to trim the input path from slashes. 
And if we evaluate this now, we should see that both the path and the allow rule is evaluated. And we can see that, yes, indeed, the, the slashes were trimmed. And, oh, sorry about that. And what we might want to do now is, rather than working with strings, because if we have more names here later, like somebody's trying to access this, we are going to need to do something like regex or, or so. So what we'd rather want to do here for uh, the path is that we'd rather want to, we, what we really want to do here is we want to split that. We're going to split that on slash. So, so instead of a string, we'll have an array to work with. I, I think this is often preferable. And this kind of shows how we can work with uh, the built-in functions of OPA. And again, if you check the, the, the docs, you'll see there's a, a reference for each of these, uh, or each of these built-ins are, are listed there. So, okay, so now we have a path to work with. And of course, we'd rather want to work with this new path that we have. So we're going to do this. So if the first, or if the, if the first path component, because in this case, we don't really care. As long as the, the method is get, this could be any user, this could be Anders, or this could be Jane. Uh, if, if someone is trying to read a user, we should still allow it. So we're just going to say that if the first path component is equal to users and the method is get, we're going to allow that request. And let's see if that works. Yeah, we can see that uh, allow is still true here. If we change something here, like, like let's say delete, we should see that now allow is no longer true. So this is kind of how we work with uh, decisions in OPA. And maybe we'd want to add another condition. Maybe we, we would want to uh, allow some form of modification. Maybe uh, a user should be able to modify their own details, but obviously not uh, of any other users. So how would we add another condition? The, the easy way to do this is simply just to add another rule. And we can have as many rules as we want with the same name. And the way it works is that if any of these rules are true, then we say that the rule named allow is true. So while the conditions inside of the rule uh, are anded together, the rules themselves are ORed. So if one of them is true, the, the result or the decision is true. And of course, uh, again, rules don't have, they don't necessarily have to be true or false, but they can return any value. But for, for this example, we're just gonna uh, go with a Boolean response. So if we say here that the first path component is users, I think we can stay with that. And the next path component here, that's the name of the user, We're following like REST conventions here. So if the next path component is equal to the name here, which is the username. So I'm gonna say input user name. And the input method is equal to put. Someone is trying to modify their own user. We should allow that. So delete, that should still not work. If we change that to put, it should work. Uh, and it does. So uh, so we, we kind of have a, a way of, in just 16 lines of Rego, we have a policy that allows any user to read uh, from any endpoint or from any uh, user, endpoint on the user's uh, kind of base path, but users may only modify their own user. So if we change here to Jane, we can see that Anders can no longer modify uh, this user because uh, that's not who I am. So, so yeah, 16 lines of Rego and it's a fairly useful policy.
So in in not in kind of a pretty compact uh, way, we've managed to formulate a policy, which uh, where we kind of decouple these decisions from from our application logic. So our applications they would not need to know about uh, these these uh this logic who gets to access what in your in your business logic you can focus on uh actually servicing the request and opa will focus on uh, on actually on enforce or making these policy decisions okay so back to the presentation then uh so we saw what we saw there was kind of an example of, of how we could write policies for for an application, a microservice or an API. Another common use case is of course Kubernetes. And how does that work then? The way the Kubernetes API works is that whenever a resource is sent to be persistent, meaning if you try and modify one, if you create something new, uh, so in this example here, if we do kubectl apply and we're trying to deploy a new application, that request is going to be, uh, it's going to have to pass a series of modules. And these modules are authentication, they're authorization, it's uh, a mutating admission controller, it's a validating admission controller. And there's even more modules involved, but kind of try and keep it uh, understandable here. And additionally, all these modules are chainable. So it's not just one, but there could be many authorizers involved and there could be many admission controllers in, involved. And once uh, the request is passed, all these modules, we see it's finally persisted to etcd, which is the database of, of Kubernetes. There's a whole bunch of built-in modules in all these steps. Some of them are uh, allowed by default or uh, enabled by default, and, and some are not. Uh, but what's interesting for us here is, of course, uh, the webhook. Because for what a webhook is, it's really an HTTP request. And in, in the case of Kubernetes, it's JSON. And remember, that's that's exactly what OPA is meant to do. It it services uh, requests over or JSON requests sent over HTTP. So OPA is a perfect fit for uh, authorization, mutating admission controller, or validating admission controller. OPA of course doesn't do authentication, but for these other three scenarios, uh, OPA is a great fit. So let's zoom in here on the on uh, the validating one, and uh, why why the validating one? Because it's by far the most popular module to extend. The and the reason for for that is that it allows us to build policy based guardrails around our clusters, so we can we can we can uh, build rules to enforce things like forbid any. Uh, container to download an image from an external Docker registry. We only want to allow the internal approved company registry, for example. Uh, all resources deployed in our cluster must have uh, appropriate labels. So maybe we want to distinguish team belongings, cost centers, or uh, office department, organizational policies, and so on. Ingress and host path uniqueness, another common uh, use case where we want to check that if we deploy this ingress, it's not going to be a conflict with, uh, with anything else. Uh, maybe you want to enforce TLS, deny certain attributes, uh, have certain resource allocation limits and so on. So there's, there's basically no end to the type of policies you can write for for an invalidating admission controller, and and this of course uh, allows us to build these guardrails that we mentioned before. The way it works is essentially the same as 
the, the REST API policy we saw before. The order here is a, a, a bit uh, <laughs> randomized, but the input to the left, that was obviously what was up to the right before. We can see it's still just JSON. In this case, it's a pod being submitted for uh, admission control. And in the middle, we see the actual policy. And it's a very simple policy. It just checks if there's not an input request object metadata labels cost center attributes, then this rule, the deny rule, will return a string or we will add a, a string to the set. And in this case, it will just say that every resource must have a cost center label. So, uh, before we finish, just a quick word on Opus management APIs. Because once you kind of pass the initial stage of having deployed a couple of policies, a couple of Opus servicing uh, your APIs or your microservices or Kubernetes, you're going to want to manage Opus at scale. And for doing that, there's a, a couple of API endpoints which OPA implements or which OPA reaches out to uh, for, for management features like bundles, fetching bundles. So this is really for uh, fetching policy and data from a centralized location. The decision log API uh, allows OPA to report back on any decisions made in, uh, in its uh, yeah, during its operation. So any decision ever made is reported back. So we can use that for auditing or for improving uh, the quality of our policies. And there's also a status API for like health and health check and uh, status updates and a discovery API for uh, configuration. So where do you start? My suggestion is usually just start small. Maybe try the, the Rego Playground, browse the OPA docs, and get a feel for the basics and, and how everything works. And once you kind of, once you grasp the basics, you can start looking into uh, the applications that you've worked with previously. And again, you can't really choose whether to work with policy or not. Like policy is pretty much everywhere. But, but what you can try and do is identify where do we have policy today? And once you've done that, you can start to slowly delegate some of that responsibility to OPA. And again, you, you can start small. You don't need to rewrite your whole authorization logic or, or your whole policy system, but maybe start with a single endpoint or a single role, like maybe delegate the admin check to OPA. Deploy and build experience from that. And once you're done with that, you can start scaling up. You can uh, look into things like policy management, decision logging, bundle server, these kind of management features that I mentioned. And uh, for learning, the Styra Academy uh, is a great resource. It's a free resource as well, where you have like video tutorials followed by quiz style tests. So I, I can heartily recommend that. For more management features, there's the Styra DAS, which also has a free edition, which you can try out. And uh, finally, join the OPA Slack community. Uh, we're over 4,000 members already, and it's a great way to ask questions see what others are asking, uh, what, what are the interesting projects brewing in the OPA community, and just like general good place to hang out. So uh, do join us there. And with that, I say thank you, and I hope you uh, enjoyed this webinar and that you learned something uh, about policy and uh, open policy agent. So thanks.